Uh, so welcome everybody to the first panel and the first panel uh, here at Analog Game Studies or uh, 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 and Asmodee Gaming Labs uh, Generation Analog Conference is on analog games and teaching. Um, I don't want to cut into the, the presenters time. So um, I'm going to uh, introduce all of our presenters all at once at the beginning. Um, and, and then um, each, each will then present in turn. So our first presenter today will be Catherine Croft, um, who, who holds a doctorate and co-founded Catalilli uh, Games in 2015 to design uh, fun STEM themed games for children's of, children of all ages. Uh, she has a small game design company that's created a line of award-winning board games which they pitched to, to national companies for licensing. So after earning her BS from Duke University and her PhD in neuroscience from the University of Virginia, she's performed neurobiology research for eight years, mostly at the National Institute of, uh, Institutes of Health, the NIH. And now she's a public uh, high school teacher who focuses on the subjects of biology, anatomy, and physiology, chemistry, and AP research. One of her proudest achievements is the nomination for the Superintendent's Innovator of the Year Award for 2019-2020. Um, games are the centerpiece of her teaching style, and Catalilli Games grew out of her desire to reach a nationwide audience here in the United States. Her mission in life is to enhance public knowledge of STEM concepts, and she views board games as a powerful tool to accomplish that. And actually, I, I, I'm going to change. I changed my mind. I'm just going to uh, have you present now, Catherine. Now, after you've gotten uh, this intro, and then we'll introduce the, the rest of the uh, participants in turn. I'm just going to add that uh, Emma uh, Costapolos has been moved to panel three, so so she will not be presenting uh, here, but but uh, Catherine will be. So thank you so much, Catherine. And and do you have slides to share? I do. Thank Please. you so much. Let's see. Can I? Hold, does host disabled screen sharing? Yep. Yep. So that would be um, that would be Aaron. Aaron, um, do you have the screen sharing capabilities for? Let's make, let's let's make sure. I, I think I also have the ability to do that. I mean, and again, for those who are participating, if you. There we go. Okay, yep, yep, there you are. You're now co-host. So, okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. That was very nice. And I'm just absolutely thrilled to be here. So thank you so much for inviting me to speak on my experiences. Um, so I'm going to be talking about, um, I'm kind of the, at the interface of theory and practice where I'm actually now a teacher and I use these games in the classroom. So I'm gonna be focusing on how to best do that and why to do that and uh, the best practices basically. Um, so I wear, let me close this here. I wear three hats basically, as was mentioned in the intro. So I am a neuroscientist by training. I did eight years of biomedical research, um, but I realized, um, I, well, I was always the one doing the STEM outreach and teaching the new people and going out to high schools. And that's really, even though I loved research, that was my passion. And I saw the huge gap between scientists and what they do every day um, and the public. And I think that's become especially clear in the past two years with COVID. There's just a, such a discrepancy and our STEM education is very poor. Um, and so I took the plunge, became a teacher. I've been a public high school teacher for the past five years. It's my passion. I love it. It's the hardest job I've ever had in my life, but it's also the most rewarding, even though I don't get paid much or respected much, but um, I love influencing children's lives. Um, and so out of that, when I started teaching, um, I realized I've always been a board game lover my whole life. And I realized that games are the most effective way of teaching. So I started incorporating them and designing new ones for my class. Um, and then it just basically took off and I co-founded my own STEM game design company about six years ago. So that's who I am and where I'm coming from. And I wanted to let you know as a teacher, what, what happens when you use board games in the classroom and how is the best way to do that? So um, I'm going to cover three things like abstract thinking versus content knowledge with board games in the classroom. Um, also lesson integration, like how to make a lesson plan using a board game that's effective. 
and the types of games that you can use. And so someone mentioned earlier, they had a question about what board games do you like to use in the classroom? So I'm gonna go through tons of them. Um, so you'll see ones um, in my presentation. So first, just a note about abstract thinking versus content knowledge. So board games and games in general have long been known to be more engaging. Um, teachers know this, the general public knows this, right? But, and they also have been established by psychology to help enhance brain development and critical thinking, um, especially at the early ages, but this can happen throughout life because the brain is very plastic. Um, but what's less known is how to teach content knowledge with the games. And I think that's where a lot of resistance comes in from public school districts is that they need test scores. And I'm still evaluated by standardized test scores. So, as teachers, we have very limited time. Um, there's never enough time to teach everything that we're supposed to teach. And so a lot of teachers um, make the mistake of trying to do like cramming in memorization. And that's not necessarily the best way of doing it. And so I think they're scared of using games as it might take away from their you know, cramming knowledge in for the test, unfortunately. So um, there's a lot of research coming out that shows that games can be used to teach content knowledge. And I've seen that in my own school. So I wanted to share that with you. Um, and also my own company, we've done a little bit of research on this. So we did a collaboration with Yale University. Um, I think that was three years ago now, um, where this is actually a digital game, but they asked us to make one based on immunology for their immunology course. And they compared that to just a straight lecture. And so you can find that in simulation and gaming um, the journal. And then also this picture is one of my students who on his own accord, not through me, he wanted to take some of my own board games and, and test them for his research project. So he took two of mine, um, a genetics game and a coding game and took them to elementary schools and gave them a pre-test and a post-test. And his, this is pilot data, I wanna stress, but he did find that they performed better on the test after playing the game. So I wanna pursue that in the future and, and see what happens. Um, so, okay, how do you integrate a game into a lesson plan? You can't just throw a game at the, the class and expect them to learn what you want them to learn. So I have three key factors. So one is time. Like I mentioned, um, time is very precious to a teacher at any level. Um, and so uh, most schools that I know of are 45 minute blocks. I happen to be 90 minutes. So I have a the luxury of that um, because we are on the semester system. But so you have, I can't spend three days on a game, right? Like I couldn't play risk in my class and, and like, it would waste too much time for me. It's, it's, it's you know, very limiting. Um, so I have to consider what can I fit into my one lesson? And also I have to frame it with pre and post activities. That's very important for getting across the, the key concept that you want your students to know. So for instance, this is something that I would typically do for a lesson plan. So as I mentioned, scaffolded learning is key. Um, and so I have a pre-game activity, which could be a variety of things. It could be like a poll of previous knowledge that they have. It could be some like definitions that we go over, some vocabulary. It could be me, you know, bringing up the new concepts, introducing them before, like it's a variety of things that you can do. And then you have them play the game. Um, I typically have 24 students to a class, sometimes a little bit more. And so I'll have six sets of games for, and I'll go through that in a bit about budget, but um, they'll play the game and then we'll do a post game activity. And this can either be a formal assessment where I give them like a quiz, I've done that before, um, or it could just be a discussion of the concepts as a class. You can also do something called an exit ticket where the students have to write, like answer one or two questions about like, what did you learn today? Or something about the lesson before they leave the class. And then you as a teacher can take that and see, okay, did my class really get what I was wanting them to get? And then it's not like a formal assessment. It's more like a formative assessment. So you can see how your lesson is going. Um, and so key factor number two is motivation. So it really depends what level you're teaching on which games you're gonna use. 
So you need to know as a teacher, and most teachers know this after the first week or so, like the personality and style of their class. Every class is different. Um, and you need to know what games will best connect with your students. So age is the most important factor, right? So um, Quantic Foundry has um, online these board game motivation profile surveys. Um, and I took one from my high schools in this instance. And so for my high schoolers, the most important thing to them is to win. And I, this is true. <laughs> They're very competitive. Um, but the second thing is accessibility. It has to be easy to learn. And I witnessed this as well. If the rules are too complicated, um, they just don't even, they just give up. If they have to read more than like five minutes of rules, it's, it's not going to happen. Um, and so you've lost them. So it has to be really, really simple. And um, I'll try and just explain the rules really quickly if I can, um, just depending because my classes are kind of big sometimes. But that is very, very key. Um, if you're younger, because I've also taught different classes, like even preschool and elementary and middle school, um, I used to work at an after school science center. So younger kids don't really need to win all the time. They want to be silly and have fun. And that needs to be the most important thing that you do. It also depends on what level you're teaching. So I actually teach the general biology classes, not the honors. Um, and the types of games that honors classes could play are more complex than the ones that mine. My students are not gamers. <laughs> like, most of them like have no idea when I'm talking about board games, like they don't, you know, they know Uno. So like it has to be simple and fun enough to engage people that are not motivated to learn. Um, and then the third thing is budget. So as a teacher, we don't have money. Quite honestly, we don't have any money. And um, my science budget is so small, they're not gonna spend it on games. They're gonna spend it on like actual biology equipment that we need. So I go to a lot of yard sales, thrift stores, but what I've seen is a trend of these print and play versions that um, different board game companies are coming out with. And Asmodee is actually really great at this. Um, and so this is phenomenal for teachers because we can just print it out. We can print out six copies of it and distribute it to the class. So I would really encourage more board game designers and companies to have this option, even if it's like a really simple option, but it's so invaluable to teachers. Um, and the third thing is adaptations of existing board games, which I wanted to mention, because there's a lot of mainstream board games that you can use very easily in your class just by twisting them a little bit. Um, so let me show you types of games. So these are ones like for general skills. Um, and I, this is just a sampling of things that I could use or you could use in the class. My absolute favorite from here to use in my classes is Brainspin, um, which is in the middle, the top. Um, I do this before we do experimental design. It's a creativity card game. It's very, very simple, but you show them these images, these geometric images, and they write down as many things they can think of that that looks like to them, like, you know, like a barbell or, you know, hamburger or whatever it is. And then they have to compare all their answers and see which ones are unique. You only get points for ideas that are unique. And everybody has to agree that it actually looks like that thing. Um, and then you twist the card 90 degrees and then you do the same thing again to show that like, hey, there's a new perspective on something. You can get new ideas by looking at something in a brand new way. So, um, I love, I, I noticed like their creativity increases like tenfold. I haven't measured this, but the more we play this game, the more they are like, oh, thinking of new ideas for experiments. And um, cause unfortunately the way our science education works is that by the time I get them in high school, they are used to performing recipes for science experiments. They're, they're told what to do, they follow the recipe and there's one answer that they're supposed to get which I, my whole job is to teach them, have your own ideas, have your own questions, and there's no wrong answer. Your data is what your data is. You know, that's what it is. You just have to analyze it. So this is a way I help retrain their brain to think more create, uh, creatively. Um, but if you're talking about content knowledge, I'll start with some other ones, like top trumps or timeline. These come in a variety of different subjects. So depending on what you're teaching, there's probably something out there for you these are very simple to use, 
You can easily incorporate them into your class time. And um, it really is like testing direct knowledge of, of facts and, and figures. Um, but I wanted to mention STEM games because I'm a neurobiologist, I'm a science teacher, this is my specialty. Um, my absolute favorite one of these to use is organ attack for my anatomy class. Um, I just think it's the most brilliantly designed game. And it basically you have organs, everyone has a set of organs and you kill each other off with different diseases. And everything in there is legitimate. Like you have all the vocabulary is real, all the diseases are real, and it lists which organs it affects. And my anatomy students, uh, like they love it so much. They become like obsessed with this game. And it, like they learn so much. Uh, it's, like it's incredible at teaching content knowledge. Um, but you can also use like, I love chemistry flux for my chemistry classes where you like combine different elements to make molecules. Um, and there's a variety of things here that don't necessarily directly teach you the, like, Photosynthesis is a beautiful strategy game. Um, it doesn't directly teach you facts and figures about photosynthesis, right? But you can bring up all of that in an engaging way with the game as the framework. Um, so this is some of the science ones. Um, some technology ones, and I saw somebody mention Robo Rally in the chat. Um, there's more and more coding games coming out, which is really exciting. So uh, Robot Turtles is for very young kids, I should stress. Um, Codemaster, it's more like a puzzle game, but you program, um, Think Fun has amazing coding games. And then like Potato Pirates is such a cute little game where these boats of potatoes like attack each other. Um, and it's all about coding. And then I like put one of ours on there where you program tic-tac-toe, it's called Tacto. Um, so there's a variety of those. Engineering, there's not as many direct games for that, but of course there's Mousetrap, right? The eternal Mousetrap. Um, suspend is really great at bringing up ideas from Melissa and Doug, where you balance these coat hanger looking things. Um, engineering ants, um, it's, that's a game where it really depends on the user input. It's all about creativity. You have these little obstacles and you're helping ants travel across like the bridge or whatever the obstacle is, but you have like a whole like bucket of stuff and you have to engineer these things. So it needs a lot of guidance or input from the user. And then I put another one of ours on there, which is like a materials testing game called Will It Bake? Um, the math, there's tons of math games. Um, it, math, obviously like games depend on math, right? Intrinsically. So that one, there's already lots and lots and lots. I put some of my favorite ones on here. Think Fun has great ones. There's Prime Climb. Of course there's, you know, shoots and ladders. Um, but I think I'm out of here. <laughs> so to wrap up, so if, if you want more resources, I'm happy to share. This is my, my mission in life is to help educate the public about STEM concepts. Um, so on my website, I have teacher resources, but I also have articles like the research that we did that I mentioned, um, different essays that I've written for different magazines and journals and things. So please feel free to go there and, and download anything you want. Um, and if you want to contact me, this is Catherine Croft. Um, this is my email, my Facebook, my Twitter, and my website. And shameless, shameless plug, I've taken the scary plunge of making my first Kickstarter ever, and it's coming out September 14th for our game cycle. So um, that's basically it for me. I'm assuming we wait for questions till the very end of the panel. Yes, that's how we will proceed. Um, but, but, but yeah, you, at this point, uh, thank you so much, uh, not only for, for an excellent presentation, but also keeping to time you did this, I, I, I'm offering public praise at the early onset of the conference to set a culture of, of nailing it like you did. So, <laughs> um, let's move on to our next presentation in, in, in analog games and teaching. Um, our next panelist is uh, Haley Steele. Haley, are you available? Yes, do do <clears throat> right here. Um, can I Haley. start sharing my screen? Um, Absolutely. I'm gonna I'm gonna introduce you, and then and then we'll we'll you can share your screen while I'm introducing you. How about that? We'll 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 multitask. So uh, you're now the co-host, so you can you can share screen, and I will 
give you your introduction. So uh, Samara Haley Steele, MFA, uh, goes by uh, she, her, or they, them pronouns, is a PhD candidate in cultural studies at UC Davis. Uh, she has been a LARP maker and LARP practitioner since 2002. Uh, currently still is a NASA intern and project intern director with uh, the UC Davis um, mod lab, where they're engaged in efforts to develop analog role-playing game pedagogy that may be used to teach any subject, including STEM subject matter. Her previous work includes Thermophiles in Love from 2016, a five-gender dating game that incorporates biological data about microorganisms, as well as Destination Wedding 2070, uh, which is a dark comedy about wedding planning 50 years in the future that incorporates climate data from the uh, CMIP. Steele has been part of the ultra-globalization -glo movement since 1999 and the urban farming movement since 1997. Their current work explore structural forms of oppression and ways some live action role play styles may be used to better understand reification in real world systems of power. A clarification also, uh, all questions for all of our panelists will be collected and uh, asked at the end of this uh, seminar. So, so, so again, we do have questions for Catherine, uh, so, but, but please save them for Catherine Haley and for, for um, Jorge until the end. Haley, welcome and thank you so much for, for presenting today. All right, I am just going to see if I can. Yes, yes, okay. Hello. Um, okay, gathering myself. Hopefully I'll be able to cut this beginning out. Um, hello, my name is Haley Steele. I hold an MFA in creative writing and I'm currently a PhD candidate at UC Davis, as well as a Haystack Fellow and a project director for the Mod Lab, the Digital Humanities Laboratory at UC Davis. The paper I'm reading for you today is The Maker Turn in Classroom Games, How Educational Game Making Offers a Powerful Pedagogical Paradigm. This talk very much relates to some experimental research that I did um, as a project director for the UC Davis Mod Lab during the 2019 to 2020 academic year. Part of this research involved using game design to teach topics from science while also having students hack the games to achieve educational goals in literature, theater, community studies, and emergent topics. During this project, I led two teams that worked through trial and error to develop a teaching methodology that I've come to call Game Making in Education, or GME for short. In this talk, I will discuss what GME is, connect it with the maker movement in education, and review some cases of what might be called GME in the work of other educators. I should emphasize that I'm addressing this method as it applies in post-secondary education or college level and graduate student classrooms. So the question on everyone's mind, what is game making in education? GME offers a novel paradigm in which student game makers create analog or digital games that are intended to be educational about a topic other than games. In the past, games have, have tended to appear in the classroom in a way that centers game play. In GME, game making is the focus. By treating students as the creators of educational games, their engagement with the material levels up. Likewise, instructors can use scaffolding activities to ensure that student game making engages the educational objectives. These scaffolding activities might include workshops, play tests, primary and secondary research projects, peer critiques of student games, and reflections designed to ensure students meet educational goals such as discussing, analyzing, and deconstructing models of the subject matter. Educational game making may be thought of as part of a larger maker turn in education that's been going on since roughly the beginning of the 2010s. These uh, three important qualities of the maker movement in education include giving students access to maker tools 
uh, the Maker Mindset and Maker Community. Maker tools shouldn't be confused with Maker products. Rather than simply giving students access to computers or games, students are given access to the tools they need to create those things. As for the Maker Mindset, it is playful, asset and growth oriented, failure positive, and collaborative. This is to say, the process of learning to use the tools to create is more important than what you make with them. Likewise, if you're using a maker approach, uh, an engaging group strategy session for a game that ultimately doesn't get made is considered a more valuable use of time than having students produce a perfect game in silence and isolation. The process is more important than the product, and the process should be collaborative. As for maker communities, they are orga organized horizontally with co-makers rather than leaders. The role of instructor becomes more of one about offering access to tools and community and having a little bit more experience to help students save time by making perhaps different mistakes than you did in your previous making endeavors. A model a bit closer to apprenticeship begins to emerge. As for accessibility, a number of early studies have shown that the maker movement in education is promising in potentially better serving marginalized students. One study of a youth program found that the use of a project-based maker movement strategy regarding e-textiles offered a way to bridge the gender gap in STEM topics with female students demonstrating increased motivation to learn about these topics after the maker intervention. So ultimately, beyond being an extension of the maker turn in education, game making in education uh, is also an application of other proven educational methods, including Dewey's project-based learning and Kolb's experiential learning. A number of instructors in the humanities, STEM, and social sciences have demonstrated teaching methods that might be thought of as fitting within a GME framework. In one application, of the GME approach, Joseph Dummett and Whitney Lariat Smith co-taught an undergraduate social science class in which students were tasked with designing a digital game about the behavior of fracking corporations. Game making and scaffolding activities were used to guide and build an appetite for social theory, which students used to make sense of the things that they were learning about the fracking corporations while they researched their sometimes counterintuitive behavior. Dumont emerged that uh, students were doing graduate level work as undergraduates as they developed unique social sciences theories to make sense of the data that they were modeling for their game. He concluded that game design offers a powerful pedagogical paradigm for teaching theoretical social sciences research to undergraduate students. In the image here, you can see the start screen for FRAC, the, the digital game and board game that students designed as part of that class. And I'm gonna move this so you can see the citation really quick if you wanna read what uh, Joe DeMott wrote about that experience. All right, and another example of what might be called GME. Um, in this example, Evan Torner devised an application for game making as part of his German literature class at the University of Cincinnati, wherein students played and critiqued student made freeform LARPs about German literature, including Goethe's The Sorrows of Young Further. Torner showed how games can be used to interpret literature in comparable ways to an analytic essay, with students making game arguments about literature through their game design choices. Other students played the games and offered secondary text critiques, deepening their understanding of the source material through scaffolding activities in which they evaluated their classmates' game-based adaptations of the primary work.
in a third example of GME in action, Dargan Frerson at the University of Washington uses game making to organize a yearly upper division atmospheric science class in which students design games based upon predictive climate data from the CMIP-6. Many of these games are released at earthgames.org as part of a student design studio affiliated with the university. Through game making activities, students develop unique interpretations and dramatizations of scientific data and findings, translating concepts from their field into playable projects they can share with their friends, while also demonstrating their ability to model dynamic earth science systems. These three efforts show how game making and education is quite versatile and may be used to teach virtually any topic. Additional research is needed to further assess the, uh, the efficacy of student game making as a method for teaching topics other than games. Observations of these classrooms suggest that the use of game making may positively influence student interest, strengthen analyses of the material, and help students become more effective communicators of source material. Objectives of these three classrooms, or observations of these three classrooms, also suggest that the use of student game making may be an effective way to teach complex systems thinking. Uh, what is known as theory in the social sciences and humanities, or modeling in STEM. Likewise, the use of what might be considered GME to teach systemic thinking has appeared in classrooms led by Diana Leonard, uh, LaShawn AZ, and Jenea Kemper. Dr. Leonard's work at Lewis and Clark College includes guiding students in independent studies and group study projects in designing student games that demonstrate their understanding of principles from psychology, especially pertaining to identity and asymmetrical power relations. Dr. AZ at UC Davis has worked with students, including high school students in underserved communities, to create ARGs and ARG material that reflects their experiences of police brutality. Additionally, Jenea Kemper is a LARP maker and critical race theorist who has engaged college students in LARP design projects relating to her theory practice of emancipatory bleed. These three educators' work demonstrates how student game design projects can help learners make sense of systems of power in their daily lives. It is also worth bringing attention to the reality that as I was compiling the research for this paper, there was far less self-documentation and peer-reviewed coverage of these three pedagogical projects by women of, co of color even though they have been just as groundbreaking uh, just as groundbreaking as the three other projects which were led by white males. I attribute this gap in documentation to a larger well-documented problem in academia in which academics of color receive less support for novel work and also experience increased unacknowledged uh, service obligations compared to their white counterparts. In researching emerging pedagogical methods, these race gaps and gender gaps in peer-reviewed documentation of novel work are thrown into focus, bringing to light one expression of structural racism and sexism codified by the Academy. Patrick Jagoda has argued games and gamification represent expressions of power within the present social order. Through game making, students are empowered as creators of the mechanisms that have come to structure their own lives and behavior. As Jagoda argues, a game itself is a type of experiment. Likewise, Alinda Y. Chang has argued that games may facilitate a stronger relationship to the ecological world, and rather than separating us from nature, games can bring us closer to it. Also, the work of Stephanie Bullock and Patrick Lemieux encourages game design projects to always engage the metagame 
to see, mod, and hack structures external to the game and that lend the game form. I argue that through game making, which I approach as both the creation of games and the hacking of the platforms and social structures surrounding games, students can work to prefiguratively negotiate relations between the human ecology, um, the human economy and the ecology. While there is no time in this talk to discuss the research um, uh, in which this theory was brought into practice uh, in the Mod Lab two years ago by my research group, I will leave you with a few photos from that work um, and a graphic that I designed uh, drawing from the work of Martin Anderson and Martin Nielsen that I call the Mixing Desk of Educational LARP Making. I see this mixing desk as a tool for educators to use when designing educational game making curricula and hope to explore it more in further papers. Thank you all so much, especially those on the West Coast who woke up very early to come to this talk. I am available via email for further questions. My email can be found uh, right up there on the left. Thank you so much. But uh, th thank you so much for that talk, Caitlin. Uh, we're going to move on to Jorge, who is now uh, who has now been given presenter privileges. Or if if you Jorge, if you want to put up your slides, then I am am happy to um, uh, introduce you. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. I begin. So so I, I'll just int introduce what what you've got, and then and then you can begin. So um, we have. Um, our next presenter is uh, Jorge uh, Moya Higueras. I hope I, I, I pronounced that halfway okay, um, who is a principal investigator in uh, NeuroPGA uh, and is a lecturer at the University of Yida and, and the uh, principal research of the NeuroPGA research team. Um, and at this point, I'm handing over um, uh, this, the, the, the mic to you, Jorge. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Jorge Moya, uh, and I thank you all the Generation Analog um, Committee for selecting our research. It's an experimental research uh, that have been uh, led by Nuria Vita Barru and, and me. And as a corresponding author, I'm going to, to present it. Uh, the study is titled Motherboard and Car Games and Gamification for the Reduction of Behavioral Executive Dysfunctions in Children at Risk of Social Exclusion. So um, nowadays, we, we know that uh, risk of poverty or social exclusion uh, is very uh, important in children populations. Uh, it has several um, uh, consequences. Uh, it increases likelihood of, of mental health problems, and also it has been linked to uh, impair the uh, intellectual development. Haft and Hoeft uh, showed that uh, the main cognitive uh, processes that can be uh, decreased with uh, this condition, being uh, children uh, or at risk of social exclusion, uh, are executing functions. So uh, executive functions are a set of, uh, of processes, cognitive processes that allow us just to think which goal we want in life and uh, to activate, plan and end all the behaviors in order to achieve this uh, goal, this objective. And then uh, these regulations, when these executive functions don't runs properly uh, are linked to different behavior, emotion, and cognitive difficulties in the development of, of people, of children, and specifically and children, they have been linked to lower academic achievement and also to uh, increasing like, the likelihood uh, to develop different uh, psychological problems. So uh, intervene in executive functions to decrease the executive dysregulation, the executive dysfunctions in children at risk of uh, social exclusion is uh, very important to help them to uh, develop properly. 
past research have found that uh, cognitive inter interventions based on modern board games can are effective to improve uh, cognitive, uh, ex the executive functions and just to decrease the executive dean's functioning. Uh, we have a uh, few studies that prove that, but all the studies uh, uh, conclude that we can, we can uh, improve executive functioning using board games. On another side, uh, gamification is known as the use of game elements in non-game context and appears to be effective if improving learning outcomes in children, but also uh, it has been uh, used in uh, cognitive interventions. And we have found that uh, adding gamification elements uh, to a cognitive intervention focused on improving executive functions uh, can improve the benefits of, of this intervention. But no other stu study previously have um, proof whether gamification and modern board games could be um, could be presented jointly, uh, just in a, in, in order to to see uh, whether uh, gamification could improve the benefits of modern board games or not. So uh, we uh, performed the personal um, study. We me, had, yeah. Uh, um, we can't see your uh, screen share right now. No. Yeah, try it. Can you try uh, sharing it again? Yeah. Wait a moment. I will try another time. Okay. Are, are you? Yes. Are that, you now, it, now, now it's, it's uh, all there. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. So uh, we, we have two main hypotheses. Uh, we thought that uh, both groups, uh, all the people, all the children that played uh, with the board games, uh, decrease significant will decrease significantly the executive dysfunctions, but we split it the the children's in two groups. In one group, they uh, we included gamification elements, and in the other group, where children only played board games, but with without uh, gamification elements. So uh, here you have. Uh, two different pictures of La Chanca and Los Almendros. They are uh, the most impoverished neighborhoods of Almeria in Spain. The present research was uh, uh, interprofessional research because we work with AFIM21, that is the main nonprofit um, association that is working there in Almeria with uh, children at risk of social exclusion. Uh, this is important because the present study was a natural experiment. A natural experiment because uh, AFIM 21 and four different schools of these neighborhoods uh, agreed on how they would implement a uh, modern board and car games intervention. Uh, and they decided that two groups are, were going to uh, implement uh, the board and card game intervention with gamification elements, and the other two schools were going to implement the same program, but without uh, gamification elements. And then AFIM21 uh, told us as a research team, if we could help them just to prove or not, uh, whether uh, gamification elements were important to potentiate the effects of board games. So is when, when we uh, just uh, took part of, of the study. Then the whole sample consisted on 283 children at risk of social exclusion. We assessed uh, the, the accepting these functions with the brief two, a test that helped us ju just to uh, diagnose also and, and, and assess uh, whether children that are assessed with this tool present behavioral dysfunctions, emo emotion dysfunctions, and cognitive dysfunctions linked with the dysfunctioning of the, the executing functions you have in the screen. Uh, also, we uh, prepared a teacher adherence a test because the, the main 
people that intervened with, with children applying the board games were teachers, were not us as a research team. So it's an ecological uh, research because we're the, the main teachers that uh, were uh, who were uh, making children play. But it was very important for us just to know if the um, teachers adhered to the intervention as it was planned in, in the first moment. So uh, we, we assess that, we assess uh, this outcome also. Then um, we finally, because different reasons, for example, some children uh, changed uh, to another school. And then uh, we analyzed, uh, statistically analyzed the, the research in a sample of 176 uh, students in the gamified group and 107 children in the non-gamified group. Um, first of all, uh, after other steps, we perform a new education formation for teachers in order to explain them how the works run, how they uh, should apply the games, and in the gamified room, how uh, the gamification should be performed. Then, uh, after another steps, we began with the intervention. All remember that all the groups, the two groups, uh, played to the games that you have on the screen. All the groups, the two groups. Then we also use uh, guidance sheets. I apologize because they they are in Spanish, but they mainly these sheets help the children on focusing on uh, other. Uh, aspects of of the of the gaming experience. When you play, uh, you are focused on, on on the game, on applying properly the rules. But it is very important, for example, to know the name of the author that the children uh, explain you briefly the main rules of the of the of the game and a lot uh, other kind of things that we think that are very important for the gaming experience. And this was applied also to both groups. The main difference between the two groups is that the gamification group, we used a rewarding system. They, uh, children in this group could uh, win different points that could be uh, changed uh, uh, with uh, just to, to, to have an insignia and the insignias uh, were, um, were better when they uh, accumulated more points. And also we use a fantastic narrative in where uh, an alien out of the space came here to planet Earth uh, in order to steal all the board games in, in, in planet Earth and uh, children has to uh, play a lot just to win this this alien and uh, let all the all the um, all the children in in the world uh, play with with board games uh, then uh, statistically we use a mixed model analysis uh, with two kind of clusters the individual cluster and also the schools as a clusters because we could find um, heterogeneity between all the schools that participated. And we also control uh, three kind of variables, the teacher adherence to the intervention, as I mentioned before, the brief to validity scale, scales, because uh, the test allow us just to, 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 to know whether the responses to the test were reliable, were uh, not mm, under the effects of acquiescence and, and other and other factors that are very important in this kind of test, and also the participants' age. So briefly, what we found is that uh, both groups decreased significantly uh, the level of um, executing these functions, but uh, the main group, the group where we found mainly these decreases was the non-gamified group, not the gamifying one. You know, as you, you can see here in both, in, 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 in all the different indexes and also in the global executive composite. We also uh, use the clinical, uh, the clinical uh, procedure of the brief two, so we could uh, analyze if we were um, capturing clinical change 
in, a, in our sample. Clinical change means that maybe one a respondent has very high levels on uh, executive dysfunctions that should be clinically relevant just to uh, intervene. And we try to find how many uh, students uh, decrease significantly uh, in a clinical significant level at uh, the executive dysfunction. And we found that in the non-gamified group, 45.8% uh, of the sample decreased with clinical significant levels, while in the gamified group, only 22.7% of the sample uh, in, in decreased in, in clinical significantly levels. So, uh, we uh, should accept the, the, the first hypothesis. Both groups, we found that in both groups, uh, playing with modern board games decreased significantly uh, the executing these functions, allowing us just to see that we, uh, we, we, um, we showed, uh, we, we, um, we found a transfer effect to day-to-day -day behaviors because the brief two, the test that we used, is the, the kind of, of executing functions and dysfunctions that uh, the test uh, assessed. But surprisingly, we found that the non-gamified group was the, the group where we found better uh, results with a better decreases in, a, in executing this function. So maybe what we have found here is that uh, gamification is too much gaming elements in a classroom just to benefit properly uh, of, of the gaming uh, methodology. Uh, recently, Thosh and, and collaborators have proposed the Brockhill covered by chocolate effect that could be related to the U on the um, inverted U shape that several uh, serious games have found. So we uh, have found that um, adding a lot of game elements in an, a school intervention, if it, it's not just to, to, to put a lot of these kind of elements. We have to, to reach the optimum uh, the optimum um, quantity of this kind of, of gaming elements. Uh, the main difference between the non-gamified and the gamified group is that the non-gamified group were playing for the pleasure of playing. Teachers arrive to the, to the classroom and they let them, the children just play to the board games and nothing else. While the gamified group, the teachers uh, had a, a more uh, protagonism in the in the intervention because they guided uh, more the intervention than in the non-gamified group. Another explanation could be possible: different psychological factors such as temperament or external factors, because we found several teacher changes between schools and and, and different other factors. So um, we know that we have uh, several limitations in the present study. The segment the segment the allocation and the assignment to the um, gamified and non-gamified group was non-random. Uh, and also uh, the test that we used is a behavioral one and, and we need to, to use perform, uh, performance tests in order to better assess the executing functions. And also it should be better to have a passive control group just to control all the possible explanations. Uh, we uh, are happy to, to announce and to share with you that uh, we have been awarded uh, with an award uh, by the gaming lab just to improve this research and is a research that we are uh, now performing. Finally, and uh, just uh, to finish, um, thank you for, for your attention. And remember that adding uh, a lot of gaming elements in a classroom is not a synonym of benefits of uh, of of of, of vaccine. So uh, we uh, need just to apply um, as a results point a modern board game uh, intervention that is is effective to improve uh, or to decrease in in this case executive dysfunctions or uh, using uh, gamification in another context. So thank you so much. You have here 
our uh, emails and our uh, social network um, way of, of contact. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jorge, and also thank you again for, for keeping the time. Everyone has kept the time, which actually leaves us with lots of time for discussion at about 30 minutes or so, if we'd like to take that time. Um, we, we do have uh, uh, some questions for uh, various panelists, and so I'm going to direct our attention to the Q&A. Uh, one question actually was asked by Michelle King, um, who I don't know if is still in the audience, but, but um, is an important one, and this was one for Catherine uh, Croft, which is how might we interrogate how we think about uh, time and learning? And so that's that's a, a sort of direct uh, question before we we hit the rest of the Q and A. So, Catherine, do you want do you want to field that? Yeah, that really needs to be explored, um, if nothing else, to show teachers and principals that uh, how best to use their time, and that games can be used effectively in the right timing and framework. So, um, basically, if you're crunched for time you're less likely to use games because you think they're wasting your time. Um, but in fact, if you just cram facts in, right, it's short-term retention of knowledge. If you play a game, it's more long-term. And I can't cite any studies right now, but I mean, that's what I read in the past and learned in the past from my neuroscience hat. So, um, so sh this is the problem with the whole standardized test situation. Right, because we still have these tests that we're accountable for. So teachers can't really worry about long-term retention, right? Even though they should, like that's what we're supposed to be doing. And that's what I do. Um, but like there's a short-term retention that needs to be done for the state to be pleased, for the school to be accredited, for the teachers to be evaluated correctly. So that that's really an important area that people need to like tease out all the details too. I entirely agree. Thank you. And and uh, another question: um, Can you elaborate a bit on a need to win as an important criteria for uh, students? Uh, um, does it does it only imply winning against other students or game participants, or is it this desire can be fil fulfilled by cooperative victory against the game system itself? Excellent question. So my absolute favorite type of game is cooperative. I love them. Um, I use pandemic sometimes in my class. Pandemic Iberia as well is really good for teaching like diseases like that can't be cured or couldn't be cured. Um, what I have found is that my high school students are more engaged if it's a singular win. If it's them against other people, like there's lots of drama, there's lots of talking back and forth. Um, and it depends on the class, right? And it depends on the level. And because um, I noticed that my anatomy class is kind of more advanced students. And so they do enjoy the cooperative um, in the pandemic. Like they're the biomedical research team and it's really exciting. And it's like the drama builds and they don't mind it. But most of my classes, they want to be the sole winner. And I haven't come across too many problems with like people losing then, you know, flipping the board. Like I haven't really come across that, thank goodness. Um, but yeah, there's a, a, a singular need to win most of the time, which is not true for little kids. Little kids, like they like, they like the teamwork. They like the cooperative. It's just that my older teenagers are like that. Thank you. Uh, I have my own question for Haley. Um, if you're there, Haley, um, I uh, am interested. So again, Haley, are you available to answer questions? Um, I think so. I have the camera off. I'm oh, yeah. hoping you, that will help. You with... are. You are. Your audio is crystal clear. That makes that. That's great. Um, what I'd like to know is um, what what sort of dialogue can we envision if we have a STEM-based game that then responds to another STEM-based game that responds to another STEM-based game, right? So, so how do we uh, make that le legible to people, this, this larger academic dialogue? So normally in academic uh, discourse, we have citations, which kind of show the, the big chain of, of um, discourse. How do we show that um, 
you know, in, in different games, especially if we are, say, taking a 10-year period and different games are responding to each other over time? That's, that's a really interesting question, Evan. And I kind of want to throw that into the context of a game-making classroom. You know, so it's like if students um, were given the game Pandemic as an example of a STEM-based game, you know, and they, they play it, and then they have a, a unit on um, uh, microbiology, you know, or, or on, on vaccinations, um, or sort of a social sci science studies of, of vaccination hesitancy or something. Um, they could they could use that game to, to as a, a sort of basis to develop you know develop a new game and kind of create it as a response to to the first game. So um, you know kind of thinking about the way you know you're you're looking at games as like a form of secondary um, <clears throat> critique um, on, on literature. You can have games critiquing games um, or or games that you know are, are essentially you know critiques or analysis or argument arguments of uh, of scientific models. Um, uh, so so yeah, I don't know. I guess um, it 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 would be interesting to see um, more work you know done in, in in STEM game making to kind of model the discourse of of how. Uh, how that could go. Yeah, I asked that question because uh, a, a typical ludography, right, that's usually talking about the game design elements, but what, when you're using it as a secondary form of critique, your presentation highlighted the fact that, wait, you know, you're also, you also have a content issue, right? You're responding to the arguments that it's advanced and not just the game design. So really, really interesting uh, food for thought, especially when translating sort of what I what I wrote into to a STEM context because it's got a, it's got some different uh, uh, connotations. Uh, Jack Murray asks uh, about um, what what your thoughts are on larger scale analog games such as John Hunter's World Peace game. I'll put that in the chat. Um, if you don't know what it is, then that, that, that's fine. It's, but, uh, but you can also, if you know about big games or these larger strategic uh, games, I'm thinking of like World Without Oil um, and a, a couple of other games that, that are largely communicative and hypothetical among the participants. Uh, if you want to, you can answer that, right? What, what about big games or larger scale analog games? And again, you, you know, that, that doesn't have to be answered, but that it is a it, it is something in the room, I get because I don't know if you know of it. I I guess I'm I'm not familiar with um, with World Peace specifically, but the work I was doing involved larger scale analog games um, and games that can be that could potentially be run, you know, between five or seven classrooms. Um, and I I see I see large scale analog games as serving as what St Susan Lee Starr has called a boundary object, um, where you can have kind of a large game, students hacking it uh, and creating kind of cross-disciplinary uh, discourse uh, through through their efforts to, to hack or, and modify, modify a game. So um, I'm definitely a fan of, of larger games for reasons of accessibility and, and creating many kinds of spaces for students to interact with. Thank you, Haley. Uh, the next couple of questions are for Jorge. Um, the first one's from David. How were executive def uh, dysfunctions determined in the children that your team studied? Were they diagnosed with ADHD or was there another uh, diagnostic method? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for the question. Yeah, uh, well, the, the test that we use, the brief tool, is the main uh, assessment tool that we have in the world just to assess uh, executive dysfunctions in children. The, the, the main test that, that we use uh, is not a diagnostic uh, test because uh, nowadays the executive dysfunctions uh, are not um, 
are are not um, are, are not di diagnosed using, uh, for example, um, different kind of of, of uh, handbook just to diagnose uh, mental disorders. I don't know if you if you know the DS DSM Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, just that all psychologists and psychiatrists uh, used to 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 assess and diagnose. ADHD or autism or, or, or other uh, mental problems. So executive dysfunctions have not reached the, the, the entity to be, include, to be included in, in this kind of, of, of manual. So we, we, we have no way of, of, of uh, uh, diagnose executive dysfunctions in the same way in the same way than ADHD could be diagnosed. So what we have is this, uh, is this test, the brief two, that allow us to assess uh, the executive dysfunctioning of, of each children, and also as is well uh, permitted and, and, and validated instrument, we have we can compare the raw score of each children with the uh, mean and um, uh, statistical and 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 um, sorry the standard deviation of of the of the main study where the the test uh, was uh, was validated and then we we can we can see if the children uh, reach a clinical uh, label that that could be used to intervene uh, by psychiatrists and psychologists yeah, just it, 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 it was the main reason that we used this this test because it's the only way we have nowadays just to to know in a clinical uh, sense if a, if a child uh, has uh, executive dysfunctions or not. Thank you. I, as a follow up, uh, Abby Lobenberg asks. Um, Jorge, when you talk about social exclusion in your presentation, can you explain what that means in Spain? Um, you know, does it mean expulsion from school, suspension? Does it mean not having friends? Uh, you you no. also talk about students with clinically significant ED as well as autism, ADHD. So I figured this was a, a companion question. Yeah, 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 okay, okay. Thank you, thank you so much for letting me explain this uh, a bit more. Um, a social exclusion, it, it's nothing about if, if a child um, um, has problems with their peers or not is uh, is about the uh, family socioeconomic situation is linked to poverty in in spain just to be considered at risk of social exclusion uh, you have to live in a family with low resources where for example both uh, um, both um, father and, uh, and the mother uh, uh, have not been working during the last six months. They have uh, several difficulties to find a new job. Uh, they have uh, low resources in their, in, their, in their homes and these kind of things. You know, so they, it, it's a concept more linked to poverty than with uh, social difficulties of, of, of children. Excellent. And now, now we're going to get into um, a discussion that's happening not only here, but also on the Discord um, about intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. And I also am inviting uh, Catherine and Haley to comment on this. Um, keynoter Scott Nicholson notes that past gamification research shows if you add rewards to something that is fun, players will be less likely to want to return that fun activity without the reward. Have you looked at the long term impact of that on your research? Um, do you, students who are rewarded return to the board game on their own? And the general question is, you know, what is the role of extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation uh, in, in your particular, um, you know, game learning models? And I'll add to that, that Scott is concerned about the harm that might have been caused uh, specifically with, with, with um, you know, the intrinsic motivation being, being kind of, uh, you know, lessened uh, by, to, for the students who are playing the board games. Um, especially because people in the conference here are the ones designing these games for them. Um, I'll go first on that. So I have, I entirely agree with that. And so when we play games in my classroom, I make sure it's fun. 
that's what I, I rarely actually like quiz them at the end or give them a prize for winning or like I, I pick something that's fun and I just want them to play for the sake of play, which I think one of the other um, panelists mentioned, like that is the most important thing. Um, and so I only like quiz them if like, if there's a class that's um, very unmotivated or difficult, because I do have a lot of the students who just don't want to be in school. And I'm just frankly happy they're showing up to school. <laughs> um, in some cases, I'll do that just to make sure that they actually play the game. Um, but yeah, they learn much more um, if they're just having fun. And then they'll ask to play again. Like if there's free time and someday they'll be like, oh, can we play that again? And like, that is the most reassuring thing to me. It's very important. Excellent. Haley or Jorge? Yeah. yeah. Haley, Haley, and, and, and then... Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, then you'll respond to yeah. Okay, Haley? <laughs> Let me think. Um, so, in I guess the type of LARP that I was having students design is more the crunchy LARP, um, actually more of the kind that has um, extrinsic motivators, you know, sort of win scenarios where you're having players fight a boss. But the reason I did this was because it's easier to design games like that. Um, so when mindset is the students are the game makers and not the game players, you can sort of create this like maker space um, for students that are, uh, you know, creating games that have different objectives, you know, the, the objective for their, their work being entertain your friends while also demonstrating to me and the other members of the, the graduate student uh, and professorial community evaluating your work that you've educated or created an, a piece of uh, educational material about, about the STEM topic, you know? So we would have these sort of performative um, metagaming moments where if you wanted to create a new kind of crunchy rule for the, the game rule book, we have this RPG system called Savad, um, you have to uh, sort of take part in this rules defense where you have a, a committee of you know, other of graduate students and, and other uh, other students sort of evaluate your rule and grill you on the science. And at the end of the day, you know, you're you're not you're not you're not being graded about whether you know you you had ideas correct or or not. But it opens up a maker session in which, as you're defending, your starts co-working on the rule together and says, "Wait, are you sure you want it that way? If if that makes sense." So there are these intrinsic situations, you know, we create where they're motivated to sort of engage performatively as a game maker, as a rule smith, um, as a LARP maker and all that. But the game they're making might include sort of extrinsic motivators. So I kind of like to move between those spaces while having students actually read about intrinsic and ex extrinsic motivation. So I have them read a bit of Sarah Lynn Bowman's work as they're, they're working on that. Perfect. Jorge? Yeah, I totally agree with, with uh, my partners in the panel. And also, as Catherine has said, uh, we thought that fun is the, is the key point. If you design a, a, a game uh, more focused on, on learning uh, questions than uh, fun, uh, may, uh, it is very probable that, that this game is not going to, to, to run properly. Uh, uh, in, in, in the classroom, because when when children and, and, and adults and all the people uh, wants to play a game, they they want just to to take fun when 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 they are playing. So the, the key point is that the that the game should should be fun, and and also just uh, I. I have a question uh, because I, I don't know when when we uh, think about extrinsic and intrinsic motivation, uh, which kind of motivation we, we are talking about. I mean, uh, in 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 this in in the study that I have presented that in in another ones, uh, a lot of children at risk of social exclusion uh, are very absent. They they show very absentism. Uh, they several days they uh, they don't go to to attend the school and when we uh, began with the with the research project several all of them just wanted to come to to the school just to what to play but also just to take the benefits of playing and attend all the other uh, all the other classes so yeah 
it's probable that they are coming with the extreme extreme motivation just to play games but then um, step by step and, and also what theory uh, say is that the step by step with these uh, gaming experiences they uh, we, we can uh, do they we we can perform that their intrinsic motivation just uh, increases and then uh, they they can uh, be on, on on the school all the time so well i i don't know the the correct answer but i think that uh, we can uh, help students and, and also in our case uh, children at risk of social exclusion just to go to the school with this kind of ludic methodology that we nowadays know that can help them in improving not also not only uh, executing functions but also uh, different academic skills such as uh, maths and these kind of things and if i can build on that as well so um when I first tell my students, we're playing a game today, um, they're like, Ugh, because they're so used to educational games that are just like, here's a fact, <laughs> you know, yeah. like a, a lot of like in the past games were very direct educational and the kids know it and they know you're trying to trick them by making it a game. So that's why I like to use mainstream games um, that are actually fun and that they have these themes to them that can be incorporated into the classroom. Um, and that's why I think um, I would love for more companies to include like little, you know, guide for teachers or something in these games because they're so fun and kids love playing them, but we need to get them more in the classroom as like actual fun games. You know, I, I kind of want to piggyback on that a, a little bit, Catherine, because some of the research I looked at um, before starting my project, there's a researcher at the University of Washington, um, Teresa Horstman, who wrote her dissertation about the, the, the exact problem you're talking about with educational games, about how you'll get these educational games that uh, aren't quite good games and aren't quite good educational tools. <laughs> like they kind of miss both marks and mm -hmm. sort of the, the trick or hypothesis with making educational games is, so students are creating something that, you know, probably isn't gonna hit prime time, uh, isn't gonna get mass distribution, but through the process of creating the educational games, they're, they're actually learning the material. And I guess Teresa Horstman noticed this when she was making educational games, she was like, oh, wow, I'm learning a whole lot about this random material. And it's like, you know, maybe there's there's a method there to that where educational games have their use, but it might not be through through gameplay. But I find it really interesting that you're you're utilizing mainstream games, which kind of matches this whole tangent of, of research I was doing in the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. And, and I, I would say um, from my cynical Marxist perspective that that a lot of edu edutainment games actually come from sort of a business model developed in the 80s by Don Rewich and, and Mech, which created a, a popular computer game for the United States uh, educational market called Oregon Trail. Maybe you've heard of it, maybe you've played it, but, but that business model itself had, became much more important in, in um, designing games than actually the content of the game itself like what how what is this game teaching you and and is this game fun and all these kind of questions that we're now asking so a, a lot of what we consider to be educational play comes from a specific place where people are not actually interested in either the education or the play beyond a, 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 an instrumental model of marketing that's just again me very cynically responding to to that but but that I'm, I'm glad now that that we're having very serious conversations about this I'm gonna uh, put we, we had a few questions related to Jorge's talk um, one is uh, you know how did children win gamification points by winning the games or by playing slash interacting and also um, do you have your hypothesis to why students weren't as motivated through gamification if you feel like you've already answered this you can go with that but th this suggests uh, is this related to creativity and performance okay so uh, we had uh, a table just to to see uh, which was the, the the way to win the points and to change the, them uh, for the insignias 
there were a, a lot of different ways to, to, to win the points, just winning in, in when, when they uh, play to the games, but also uh, using properly the, the, the sheets that I explained, just remembering, for example, the, the author's name, uh, uh, just uh, treating properly the, the other players when they were playing. So a, a lot of different things or, or behaviors that uh, could let them just to, to win this, this kind of, of, of points, you know? And then uh, about uh, the, the what or, or how we can explain the, the controversial result, the, why the gamification group uh, decreased less uh, the um, the executive dysfunctions. We have several several uh, hypotheses there. Uh, for example, um, several children. Uh, we did not register this this kind of of responses. We have uh, them because they they told us uh, privately. But uh, several children told us that when when in the gamified group they were stressed because they have to think about too many uh, questions, too many behaviors. If I win, I will uh, win. If I win in a game, I will win two points. Then I should uh, exchange these points to, to an insignia and these kind of things, you know? So th they told us that, that they sometimes were stressed because we have to to play not for the pleasure of, of playing as, as as we told before but uh, just to to reach uh, another kind of goals that only entertaining and and the non gamified group were more focused on the game experience just playing only because they wanted the, to play and because the teacher uh, prompted them just just only only to play you know uh, Another explanation could, could, could be done because, for example, the, the experimental design was not randomized. So maybe we, we found that the two mm, schools that uh, pertain to the gamified group had different uh, characteristics than the non-gamified schools, you know, and we want just to, to make a randomized trial in, in order to, to, to better control these this kind of effects. So maybe we, we, we have found different psychological uh, effects in the sample, but also uh, the, the experimental design uh, don't allow us just to 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 have one unique explanation, you know. And I don't remember now if you have uh, made me a third question, or I don't know if I missed uh, some questions. Uh, it, it was it was regarding uh, creativity and performance, right? So so ah, it, yeah. is that um, uh, related to uh, the the intrinsic motivation question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we, we did not assess creativity or or any uh, cognitive uh, function associated to to creativity, and so I have no 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 answer uh, regarding our, our research. But uh, I, um, I suspect that probably uh, as in another kind of games, to creative minds, to creative children. Using creative uh, games should would be motivate them a lot, uh, but non-creative uh, children maybe uh, see them uh, not not very useful, you know. But I think that that uh, and is a, a, a research question very interesting that we want to 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 answer in in a future properly just. To know if we can improve creativity in in the classroom using board games, I, I think that that it, it could be done, but we, we have to to design a, a good uh, study, uh, an experimental study, just to prove it. Wonderful. And now we have actually what uh, considering to be our final question for this round, which is from Leonid. Um, this is a question for all the participants, particularly for Haley, and that is, uh, you know, can a gaming illiteracy in terms of analog games become a problem for playing or designing games as part of education? Um, I currently cannot make some of my students understand how a tabletop role-playing game is supposed to work. 
Uh, the problem is not that they cannot understand the rules. They cannot grasp the logic of these mm -hmm. games, freedom of actions, agency, approach to storytelling. And I've sometimes encountered the, so, so in, in other words, play culture, right? Um, and, and I've sometimes encountered the same problem while trying to make people even familiar with video games, participate in LARPs and tabletop games. You just fundamentally cannot understand the logic of those types of games. Have you encountered this problem? How do you overcome it? And again, this is, this is for everybody, but Haley, you're on the spot first. Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, in the curriculum I developed, uh, you know, while we created games in a number of media and genres, the the main uh, game we worked on was a campaign LARP. And the nice thing about campaign LARPs is they're episodic, so you can ease students into it as players. You know, I don't recommend only game making, you wanna play the game first just to ensure that everyone um, has had, you know, experience with that game. And my, my approach, um, you know, my, my approach is to treat the students as game makers from day one, you know, to frame it that way, to say that we're making game making assignments, um, to show them rule books, you know, to let them know the way I'm writing my rules isn't the only way to do it. Here are two other rule books that are somewhat similar. And here's another LARP of a complete, here's a Nordic LARP, you know, we, we did a, a free form LARP about three weeks in, you know, because my my goal is to make sure that they have a, a level of, of media literacy. Um, so they're not, you know, running out of the class thinking they've experienced all LARPs or thinking that the LARP that I've written is the first or the only one um, of a certain type. Um, but, but yeah, definitely, I, I think just pulling back the curtain, you know, showing rule systems. And also my very first game, I had members of the local LARPing community actually come and NPC and, um, you know, kind of, you know, play, play different characters, model the, the fighting and having different people from the, the LARP community also matches like the maker movement tactic of bringing in people from whatever making community you're, um, you're engaging, whether it's like software development or what have you in the beginning. So students kind of get a sense that you're not the ultimate authority on this. There are other folks you know, that they can connect with um, who are part of this community, you know, kind of building the sense of the discourse community of the game, I think is is really important to, to get in there early on um, to facilitate that that literacy. Yeah, um, also, so for me, gaming literacy is a huge problem. <laughs> um, so I live in a, so it's like half rural, half suburban area. Most of the people here are very conservative. Um, it's a different demographic than than you know living in DC, which I used to do. Um, most of my students have no idea about board games. They know Uno, Monopoly, Connect Four, Candyland, like that's the extent. And um, I even do like escape rooms. Like I create them from my class. Um, they don't, even though as popular as escape rooms are, most of them have never have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, so I have to kind of meet them where they are and I'll start really simple instead of fighting it, like we'll play really simple games or I'll take an Uno and adapt an Uno and, and then the more we do it, cause I, I try and do a game, I don't want to say every week, at least every two weeks. It just depends. Um, I try once a week, but it just depends on what, what's going on. But, um. I'll build and build and build on that. And by the end of the semester, I will have built people that now love board games, which is also my secret mission, right? Um, but I think we as gamers and largely academics forget the general public is not familiar with any of the things that we have. So I just like, that's that's my obstacle in my, my work. Yeah. <clears throat> and in, in in our case, you can imagine the the, the big problem that that we have uh, with, with it in children at risk of, of social exclusion. They are not used to board games because in some cases uh, they have problems just to eat something that day. So they the, the families have no money just to 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 buy any 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 board game. So that's why we used as you have uh, seen in my presentation, filler games, because they are very short games with uh, very uh, simple rules. Some of them just focus only in one pro 
process. You have to uh, memorize something and just play with with memory and nothing else. Just because uh, to 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 begin step by step, and then we we think that maybe in in this uh, population, uh, after playing several filler games. Uh, such as the one that, uh, the ones that we used, maybe you can introduce uh, more complicated games, but you have to to, to go step by step and, and begin with with fillers. We we think. Well, we are now at time, and so uh, again, I would like to thank uh, a, a panelist for an extraordinarily uh, productive panel. I know a lot of. Um, our audience has, has benefited greatly from, from these insights, but I myself am, am sitting here you know, with my mind on fire trying to combine the lessons learned from both the trenches and the research. So I really do appreciate all of this. We are now going to take a half an hour break and we're going to come back at noon Eastern time or whatever time it is where you are uh, for Scott Nicholson's keynote. And I look forward to seeing you there again. And another round of applause. Uh, digitally or otherwise for, for the presenters. And if you'd like to hang out, uh, run over to the Discord. Uh, there's the panel. There's also several uh, uh, voice chats where you can just go and, and hang out if you'd like. So uh, thank you so much. And, um, and again, we look forward to seeing people back here for Scott Nicholson's keynote. Thank you so much. It's wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.